All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me and our amazing commercial lending, marketing, and client relations teams here at Fremont Bank. Uh, we are thrilled to present tonight's insightful virtual event, creating a succession plan for your business. Uh, my name is Alexis Kleinhans. I'm the Vice President of Commercial Lending and Team Lead, and I've been with the bank for 18 years. It is a privilege to be your host this evening. Like each of you business owners in attendance, we too, as a bank, have had to build and execute our own succession plan as a family-owned and privately held company. So we'd like to say we think we know what we're talking about when we assemble a group of panelists like this and provide this type of value-added content for you. Tonight's agenda will engage three of our beloved clients who have very different stories of their succession planning and a CPA and business valuation expert in a roundtable conversation. We'll start off with a local market update from Don Merrick, SVP of Commercial Lending, Commercial Banking, and then move, move into four segments with our panelists. We'll finish with a question and answer. On that, uh, as we do during these virtual events, we ask that you submit your questions via the chat box in Zoom. We will collect the questions, co collate them, and then bring them back at the end of the hour for our Q&A session. And as always, as we always like to acknowledge and spoil our clients, we will draw names for three winners of great giveaways at the end of the hour. And you must be present virtually to win. All right, with that, I am going to allow each of the panelists to introduce themselves because that will give you the most robust detail of their experience, their context, and what they're very good at and are going to share with you tonight. With that, Keith, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hey, my name is Keith Thorndike. I have um, helped 38 companies in my career. Most of the roles have been as a CXO type position and I've helped uh, buy three companies and sell three companies. Thank you, Keith. And I think, did you talk about consulting for over 38 companies along the way? I was either an employee, they hired me, or I was a consultant for those, yes. So a wealth of experience, thank you. Yeah. Uh, John Mills. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is obviously John Mills, and uh, I, um, after a brief, uh, short career with Arthur Anderson coming out of college, I joined the family business in 1989, uh, WHCI Plumbing Supply Company. We uh, sell water heaters and faucets and various plumbing supplies to uh, to the contractor trade, um, and also through our showrooms to the to the retail public. And um, in 19 and in, in 2019, we uh, we executed a sale of the family business to uh, one of the national players, a joke corporation that is also in that exact same space. So uh, our business, uh, uh, WHCI, was started in 1954 by my grandfather and uh, taken over by my by my dad in 1958. So a long storied history um, that is now taking into an, another another phase. Excellent. Thanks, John. That's why you're one of the panelists tonight, because you can speak about the multi-generational company and the exit strategy you executed. All right. Next up, uh, Leandra Schuler of a very notable brand name in pizza. In fact, Leandra, take it away. I, I regret to say I didn't bring everybody pizza. Um, nice to meet you, everybody. And Leandra, I am an employee owner of Zachary's Pizza. We are 100% employee owned. Um, I am also COO. I serve on the board of directors and I act as a trustee to our employee stock ownership plan and trust. I started at Zachary's in 1999 um, as a server and host when I was studying at Cal. And I, um, right when I hit academia fatigue, the owners offered me a management position and I thought oh, I could do this for a couple of years. Um, here I am now. <laughs> and I look forward to hearing um, from the other panelists and their experiences as well as 
any questions that folks have about ESOPs or employee ownership. Great, thank you, Leandra. Uh, and then finally, our uh, subject matter expert from the accounting and valuation um, fields, Carolyn Sillen. Hi, I'm Carolyn Sillen. I'm a senior tax manager at San Sebastian Filippo. I have, I've been in public accounting for more than 20 years and I've been doing business valuation since 2007. And over the years, we have performed valuation services for various industries and for different reasons, such as the stay and gift planning, um, buy sell agreements, mergers and acquisitions, ESOP. And we also work with attorneys on divorce cases as well. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. And Car Carolyn is going to um, give us a, a quick primer on valuation methods later in the program tonight. So there you have it. Uh, and as I mentioned already, each of the panelists uh, is a Fremont Bank client. Um, so beware Fremont Bank clients. Um, you never know when we're gonna tap on you to be part of one of our productions like this. All right, um, next what we're gonna do is get a local market update from someone you've likely seen before, Don Merrick, our SVP of commercial banking and a resident talking head on economic updates. He's got a little bit to say. Let's hope it's still timely one day later. Hey, thanks, Alexis, and good evening, everybody. Yes, I'm Don Merrick. I run the commercial lending group here. We're uh, uh, about a, a $1.9 billion um, loan group here in terms of our portfolio. And we actually produce about uh, close to a billion dollars a year in commercial loans. So we're a productive group at Fremont Bank. Um, I can't say this, this will be local. It'll be more uh, national in scope. So um, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the economy over the next few minutes. I'm gonna go fast because I have a, a lot of slides to cover, uh, but, but I wanna say a few things. First of all, uh, three things about today. First off, it's for those of you who are Star Wars fans, it is Star Wars Day. So may the 4th be with you. Uh, number two, it just so happens that it is uh, the, the Fed meeting day where they announce rates. So that's serendipitous today. Uh, but I think the most important thing about tonight is the fact that the Warriors are not playing because if they were, uh, I'd be basically speaking to myself. So, um, Good that we're in between games in the playoffs, and let's hope uh, the next few games uh, are better than last night. Okay, let's um, let's go ahead and pull up the slides, Michelle. Um, so what I'm going to do is I, I'm just going to go through um, you know the economy here uh, uh, in, in big picture terms, uh, and um, if there are questions, uh, feel free to send those in the chat, uh, or you can send an email. Um, and uh, we'll respond to those later. So I think the, the, the key about today, if anybody uh, watched the news or listened to the radio today, they, they saw that, um, you know, the theme of the day today, is, as far as I'm concerned, is it was no head fake. The Fed told us what they were going to do, and they did exactly that. So uh, we've been hearing for a while, it's most likely going to be a 50 basis point increase in the Fed funds rate, and that's indeed what happened. Um, you know, one of the comments that uh, uh, Jerome Powell made today was that job gains are robust. Well, that's putting it lightly for sure that any of you who have uh, tried to hire somebody recently, we know how tight the labor market is. Um, the market generally expects to see a couple more uh, uh, increases uh, month after month of about 50 basis points. Uh, but the key thing here um, is that the Fed funds future, so the market before today had thought maybe that, that Powell was going to hint to a 75 basis point increase next meeting in June. And he took that off the table, which is why the markets react so positively. So, you know, those of us looking at our 401ks, equities were up 3% today. That was good news. Um, the two year, uh, Treasury, which uh, is our short-term interest rate, was down 15 basis points. So that basically made the, 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 the rate curve more normalized. So uh, lower on the short end and higher on, on the high end. 
Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, nothing you haven't heard already, so high inflation. The one point I'm gonna make here is this is the PCE, which is what the Fed measures to determine how they're going to react to interest, interest rates and how they're going to uh, stay close to their mandate of you know, full employment and, and managing inflation. Um, the key here is that last, the, the month before last, this, this lags by a month. So for March, we did see a little bit of a downtick in inflation, 10 base points. Not a big deal, but it's enough that it makes you kind of scratch your head and say, you know, could inflation finally be turned the corner? Is it, is it flattening now? Potentially, uh, you know, we'll see more as we continue to get data over the next couple of weeks, but definitely something to watch. Let's go to the next slide. And um, the Fed dot plot. So some of you uh, are, are maybe familiar with this, but uh, it's one way that we use to forecast um, how, how much rates are going to increase. And each of those little yellow dots is a person. It's, it's a member of the, of the Federal Open Market Committee and how uh, they see interest rate increases. And so if you just look at 2022, that first line of dots, um, that the average, which is that green line, uh, they, the average uh, of all the Fed members, they believe that by the end of the year, the Fed funds rate will be a little under 2%. Uh, what's interesting about this chart is that that white line is, is actually what the market thinks uh, interest rates should be. So there's been a, a gap between the market and the Fed, the way they've been talking, uh, of almost 100 basis points. So that's pretty interesting. Now, this is a little dated because the dot plot only comes out every three months. So the next one we'll see is, is next month in June. So it'll be interesting to see what, you know, how this shifts, uh, especially with uh, the fact that last month or two months ago when this came out, uh, the Fed was talking about a 25 basis point increase instead of a 50. Okay, let's go to the next. Um, all right, middle, middle of the interest rate curve. Five, this is the, um, over the last, uh, gosh, this is about three years or four years, um, the five-year interest rate curve. And you can see that where we are as of this week at about 2.8% is roughly where we were back uh, in 2018. Um, the big news this week was the 10-year um, hit 3% for the first time since then. But let's look back at 2018. Uh, back then, the S&P was down 10% for the year, and the Fed increased rates four times that year. Now, sounds kind of familiar with like, what's going on in today's market. And if you look back to 2018, things weren't so bad in 2018. That was a pretty good year. So just something to reflect on. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, manufacturing data. So um, ISM is basically an index uh, that uh, 50 is kind of the indicator. Anything above 50, uh, manufacturing is expanding and therefore the economy is expanding. Um, if you look at the uh, expectations, uh, we expected it to be about 58 and it was a little bit lower. It was down around 55. Um, and then also if you look at the far right side of the curve, uh, you'll see the last couple of months have been uh, showing a little bit of a downward trend. So the good news is we're still over 50. You know, the question is, is this a slowing of the economy? Now, you know, yes, it's slowing in comparison to the last few months. If you go back six, seven months, each one of those bars is a month. But uh, you can see that, that in general, it's actually doing pretty well. We just had a huge bump right after the pandemic, as we all know, as, as factories and the supply chain started getting going again. So, so maybe not, not bad news here. Fine, let's go to the next slide. We'll just uh, really quick, GDP we thought was gonna be 3.5% at the beginning of the year. Uh, expectations are now downgraded a little bit to 3%, but 3% is still really good. We were happy with 2.5% uh, GDP before the pandemic. So 3% is nothing to shake a stick at. So, um, you know, the same headwinds, that we've been looking at. The, the, the first two, however, are newer, obviously, in the last couple of months with the war 
and with the lockdowns happened in China. But the other four things we've been looking at, and for sure, you know, there's questions about what are those going to do to the economy. Um, let's go to the next one. All right, so let's take a deep breath. Whew, that was a lot. I'm going fast. So um, let's just take a step back, though, and see where we are in perspective, okay? This is about a 45-year chart here. And those big peaks that you see on the left-hand side were the interest rates, the Fed funds rate back in the early 80s, up to about 20 20%. So here we are talking about, you know, 200 basis points in one year by the end of 2022. And we're thinking, gosh, that's crazy. But let's just remember, we are still in a historically low interest rate environment, historically low. And it's still a good environment to invest, grow your business. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, we end on an optimistic note. And, um, you know, we'll continue to watch these various indicators. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to the panel. Uh, back to you, Alexis. All right. Thank you, Don. You always do a great job taking really complex data and uh, slicing it and dicing it, making it fairly digestible for us. All right, we're going to get into the meat into the meat of tonight's uh, production. And so we're going to have four segments. Our first segment is called Around the Horn. Uh, I'm going to ask Carolyn Sillen to start out. Um, the question we are discussing is, what are the different business succession plans out there? What are the different types of plans you could devise? I mean, is that selling to employees, selling to a family member? Is it going public, converting to an ESOP, et cetera? So Carolyn's going to start out with a basic definition of that universe. And then we'll, we'll hear from each speaker on what they did specifically. Carolyn? Hi. Yeah. When you start thinking about succession planning, you know, you probably will start looking around your people around you who might be interested and who might be, you know, who are the best candidates to take over your business and continue your business. And your business is something very special. You know, you work very hard to build this business, you know, for lots of swears, not swears, sweats and tears for a very long time if it's not the entire career, entire career of yours. So to some business owners, it is more than the job. And um, it is the passion. It re carries your reputation. So when it comes to choose a successor, it might not be easy for the business owner. And your candidates could be your children if they're interested, your management people on your management team or just employees in general or it could be your competitors it doesn't matter whom you have in mind timing is important do you allow yourself enough time to train to introduce your successor to your clients and to your to your business contacts do you in, allow enough time to have them work together and build a relationship and one of the factors that impact a company value is key personnel. It is very common for closely held business. And it is critical. Yeah, if a business relies only on one or two people carrying the business, it's, it will impact the value. Yeah, the, the new owner will be worried about, you know, can he or she continue the business without you? So training your successor is a, a key factor. And therefore, we usually recommend three to five years, you know, that allows you to prepare for the tr transition. And even you're not thinking about transitioning, you know, you want to be prepared. What if someone just shows up at the door and want to buy your business, right? We, we actually have seen quite a few cases in the last six months. And how do you get yourself prepared? Number one, know the value of your business. Have an idea, have a bottom line, yeah. And number two, clean up your books. Not, I'm not saying that you, you know, people keep their personal expenses on the books or anything, but you need to be able to identify things, if the income or expenses that new owner will not be expecting to see. So, uh, we can, we'll talk about some adjustments later. And 
for example, I have an example. One time we did a valuation for a client. They usually, they normally don't do governmental work, but for a couple of years, they were granted like large contracts. For that two years, you know, of course their income went through the roof. For the valuation purposes, we need to remove those from their financial statements in determining the value of the business. And also number three, I would say, even if you're not thinking about transitioning, you know, allow yourself some time to improve your business. As part of the valuation process, we do ratio analysis. We compare your company ratios to the industry average. If you're above the average, great. And how do you maintain that? If you below the average, what can you do to improve it? Because you got to know the new buyers or the business brokers, they're using the same method, looking at your financial statements. So if you can plan ahead of time, you know, that's obviously better, right? And yeah, that's about what I have for this part. Awesome. Um, Carolyn, that was great. I, I love the three points and know your value, clean up your books and allow time to improve your business ratios when compared to your peers. Um, and, and one of the big takeaways right now is just, it's a three to five year process and allow yourself the time uh, to go through that process of a su succession plan. All right, uh, with that, let's hear how each of our panelists have approached the business succession plan. Let's start out with uh, John Mills, moving to Leandra and then Keith. Oh, John, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, uh, I started, uh, uh, I took over, uh, I joined the family business in 1989, as I said before, and um, it was in the, uh, it was in 1989, and uh, the economy was, was a little soft there in construction, but by the early 90s, we were in a good, good place. We had a good balance sheet, and we grew the business, and I, uh, and my parents were in their in their 60s. And as we were growing the business and I went to Fremont Bank to get a line of credit there, uh, they they didn't they didn't like the idea of borrowing money to grow the business. So so we executed a sale, an asset purchase in 1998. And so I became the sole owner of the family business. Um, and I started looking forward to um, succession planning almost the time when I, when I bought the business. Um, I was very active in the, uh, in the national industry um, associations, met with other business owners, made some friends, and many of them had transitioned out. So I was looking at some of the various ways that, uh, that my friends had ex exited um, their businesses. And, um, and there were lots of different ways, but at some point we figured out um, uh, so I started to learn the different valuations in our business. It was usually the businesses were valued um, by uh, multiples of, of earnings, somewhere between seven to nine, um, as the economies were, um, were uh, stronger in construction, those multiples might go up. As the future looked like it was going to be weaker, those, those multiples would be going down. So, um, so I, I, I became a, a student of that, um, of that process. The other thing I did is I, I reached out to some of the larger players. Um, over time, I wanted to get, and just in case something happened to me, I wanted to be able to have an exit strategy my wife could execute. Um, and, and so I met with some various uh, players over time and had uh, informal discussions. But in uh, the beginning of 2019, as I looked forward, um, I was 57 at the time. I knew probably the, to maximize my value to the buyers, they would want me to stick around. So, uh, so I was figuring I would want to, uh, they would want me to stick around from three to five years, which is in fact what happened. So I looked at the election coming up. I looked at a few other things, looked at the economy, and we, uh, we chose to 
to start going to market, knowing the valuations. And, uh, and then we, uh, one of the, the key factors was we wanted to make sure we closed by the end of 2019, uh, knowing 2020 might be an election year, knowing they may retroactively change capital gains taxes and things like that. So that's, that's what we did. So. Congratulations. That's, that's awesome. Thank you, John. Um, Leandra, how did you do it at Zachary's Pizza? Yeah, um, so I am obviously on um, at part of somebody's succession plan. Um, I, our founder, Zach and Barbara, in 2003, after 20 years of being in business and working really hard, um, let the crew and management team know that they were planning as their exit strategy to turn the company over to the employees. Um, they had met with top management, senior management at the time to consult with them to see if it was a concept and I, that they, you know, and a project that they would want to take on. Um, and they received a lot of confidence from upper management and decided to move forward with it. Um, they had explored all sorts of options, including selling to a third party. And they were really um, wanted to meet three goals and that wouldn't achieve it. And those three goals were essentially wanting to set Zachary's up for success in the future. They wanted to see the company go on. They wanted to reward their employees, especially those who had been around for a while and really been part of their success. And lastly, they wanted to reward themselves. No shame in that, right? <laughs> a lot of hard work went into that. Um, so they did a bunch of research um, and came on to this employee ownership idea, pursued that, and an ESOP seemed to be one that really fit those goals and what they thought would work well for Zachary's um, in the long term. And so an employee owner stock uh, stock ownership plan is um, employee owned. Um, it's a no, no out of pocket cost to the employees and it is management run. Um, so there's some differences between an ESOP and let's say like a co-op um, in that regard. Um, so yeah, we became 100% employee owned after seven years um, from 2003 and 2010, which is pretty accelerated for ESOPs. It's definitely not unheard of at all. Uh, so several ESOPs will, um, the goal is actually just partial ownership, either um, like an 80-20 split or even 50-50, there's plenty of options there. Some founders or owners, when they do that, they do it as an added benefit to the employee or they wanna, retain profits for the long term. Um, and in our case, Barbara and Zach, our founders, wanted to fully pass the torch our way, both the benefit and the risk. Um, one thing that really resonated with me that Carolyn said was um, one of the points was giving, owners giving themselves plenty of time. And I think that that is really what marked our successful secession plan or their secession plan and passing that over, they started thinking about this years before 2003. And then once they started it, they stuck with us side by side through 2011 actually is when they stepped off the board. They were very much part-time, but they were really there to support us and groom us and you know, make sure that they were handing it off in a responsible way. Awesome, thank you. You now, now shared your secret sauce with us. For the uh, for the ESOP at least. <laughs> All right, um, Keith, will you share your experience for the? Sure. Company? As I mentioned earlier, I've, I've been involved in a lot of companies, a lot of different uh, areas. I even was the CEO of a small public company after it went public. Um, all the deals I've been involved with, I have to tell you, are selling it uh, to another business. Uh, oftentimes the companies are just too large for employees to get any kind of meaningful ownership over time. Um, and so almost all the times we've worked through uh, legal investment bankers to identify different companies and figure it out. Um, uh, the structure, I guess we'll have questions or answer later on kind of what's your favorite structure things, but it's really 
uh, uh, what I've also heard with the other panelists here already is you do have to get your house in order and getting your house in order is making sure that uh, the business is running by process, not people. It's, it's improving your financials, as they said, by making sure your metrics look good. It's uh, trying to look at your future. And in general, you get a better valuation when you're growing versus when you're flat or decreasing. And so there's a little bit of timing in it. And you do have to plan this out in advance. And there's a number of factors, but I believe, again, you get experts in to help you to do some evaluation because you want to know everybody gets excited about the price the real number you want to know is okay after the price what's the taxes what are all the fees what do i get to take home and put my bank the next day and that's the thing again depending on the structure depending on the size you put in some kind of threshold uh to say okay we're going to make it work until it and at that point that's generally when you pull the trigger, so. Excellent points, um, excellent. Yeah, thank you. See, we get, we get nuggets out through the, the conversation. So uh, the next segment then we're gonna move into, it's gonna be a little bit shortened, uh, sort of a rapid fire question for our panelists, okay? So the question is, um, I'm gonna frame it this way. Who were the top three experts uh, you dealt with? So did you lean on your banker, your broker, your uh, tax planning, uh, accountant, you know, attorney, just who are the top three subject matter experts that helped you put your plan in place? Um, we'll go in reverse order. So it'll be you first, Keith. Okay. As I, I kind of alluded, um, my lawyer, that's number one. And he introduced me to generally investment bankers and this yep. had the same lawyer, multiple companies. So it's the same answer. <laughs> All right. Seems like a, a trusted advisor. Uh, yep. Leandra, top three for you. Well, I'm definitely speaking for our founders, um, but I know them well. And I was part of that process. Absolutely. Our corporate attorney, um, they relied initially on um, free information from the National Center of Employee Ownership, which is based out of Oakland. It's on Franklin Street. Um, they're a fantastic resource. And then their accountant, but I'm just going to add in a fourth because I think it's important. Sure. They were um, really um, I, not concerned, but they were aware of the, uh, um, the cultural needs around this transition. So they brought in a consultant that helped us with that organizational change piece. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Uh, what I didn't hear is your banker. Um, just a plug for the bankers on the phone. Um, we consider ourselves your trusted advisor, one of your trusted advisors, just like your CPA and your attorney are on your speed dial. Um, we would hope that you are also speaking to your banker because when it comes to debt, for instance, or um, cash flow, we are uh, you know, just as integral in terms of the evaluation, the, reading the financials, being able to talk through release of guarantees, um, change in ownership structures and in, in loan agreements, what have you. So um, don't forget to include your bankers um, in the conversation somewhere along the line. Just so you're not caught doing something that um, you didn't anticipate, like for instance, change in ownership in the commercial loan world is a, uh, a default if it's not, uh, if the bank is not notified. Now, the bank just engages in a conversation, understands, and then decides what to do with that, that debt and that obligation. But you'd wanna know that ahead of time, not ex post facto. facto. All right, uh, third segment, this is kind of when we dive a little deeper. Um, in, we call this the in-depth view. And again, I'm gonna call on Carolyn Sillen, who's gonna go over an overview of the valuation methods and just high level the tax considerations. Knowing that this is a deep, dark hole that you pay a lot of money for other experts to figure out, but Carolyn can synthesize it, um, starting with the valuation methods that you might hear. Okay, so generally there are three approaches you look at the asset approach, income approach, and market approach. 
asset approach will be appropriate if the business, the value of your business is you know, heavily relies on the, val the value of the assets you own, then asset approach will be appropriate. And the best example is if you are, if this is a real estate holding company, yeah, if you investment, if you invest in real estate, you probably would agree. If you just look at the cash flow, yeah, very often that's not the best measurement for the value of your company. So that is for asset uh, approach. Income approach, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, you, the buyer is going to buy your future earnings, right? So uh, we look at the one up big step in the income approach, if we call it normalization, like we mentioned earlier, that we want to normalize your financial statements, your income statements to a condition that the new owner could be expecting. So anything that is usually in the extra expenses in one year or less in the other year, we need to adjust those. Very typical adjustments are rental expense. Very often business owner owns their own building. They could be paying them too much. They could be paying them too little. So we need to adjust that rental expense to something that new owner could be expecting. The second one would be um, officers' compensations. Yeah, and because you own your own business, you can pay yourself, whatever. In an S-Corp setting, people usually just pay enough to meet their reporting requirement because everything's passed through to their individual returns, so it doesn't matter to them. And in, this, in a C-Corp setting, very often, if it's a profitable year, very often the owner will write themselves a, a big bonus check at the end of the year to wipe up the income. So nothing will be, you know, they don't pay tax at the company level to avoid double taxation. But these compensations are not necessary very often. They are not reasonable for what they do for their positions. So we will research what is the you know, reasonable compensation for the officers. And the best way is to find out is to actually ask the owner themselves, you know, if you're going to pay someone to do what you do, what are you willing to pay? Yeah, so that's one. And the third one is the market approach. That is the idea uh, I think Keith mentioned earlier or John did. You look at multiples. If we are able to find a good number of transactions, you know, sales of companies that are similar to yours, we look at what they were sold for. Yeah, and if we have good enough, I mean, a good number of transactions as an, as an sample, we could use their, um, the couple of multiples we look at, you know, the sales price to revenue or sales price to owner's discretion earnings. That's your take home pay. We look at these two multiples. If, if I said most of our, my sample, um, uh, similar to your company and has the same um, multiple. I can, well, I'll give you an example. For example, if we do a uh, valuation for a restaurant, I always like to use restaurant as an, as an example because they are very active. You know, usually we could find a big long list of transactions, you know, selling restaurants. If most of the restaurants were sold at 40% of the gross revenue, it is reasonable to assume or to estimate the, the value of your company at 40% of your gross revenue. It's not the only thing that we rely on, but it could be a reasonable estimate. So that is the market approach. Now, coming to tax consideration, um, it depends on how you structure your business. Typically you have asset sales or stock sales. To the seller, probably doesn't matter that much. You know, uh, stock sale might be easier, just, yeah take the whole thing. But to a buyer, they will prefer asset sale because when they purchase assets, they will be able to take depreciation deduction, you know, just that'll impact the value, not value, the earnings or income, reportable income or taxable income the next few years at least. So that's one thing to consider. And if you sell your business at a gain, I think people usually do, it's, if there's any gain, because there are two types of gain. It could, be, it, it could be a capital gain at the company level, 
or it could be at the personal, because of your personal goodwill, it could be at a personal level. For pass-through entity, probably doesn't matter that much either, because it's all passed to, to the individual anyway. But for a C corp, again, you want to avoid double taxation. Yeah, if it's a you know, if anything that could, you can reclassify as a personal goodwill, we will encourage that. So, and do I have two more minutes? Uh, two quick minutes. Okay. Go so I do, I do want to bring up this one big thing that's discounts for lack of marketability and lack of control. And that is the beauty, beauty of business valuation. Current valuation theories allow you to take discounts, adjust your sale price or transfer price when you transfer fractional interest. Meaning if you want to transfer, we'll use the estate planning for, gift planning for an example. If you want to transfer business to your children, you don't have to transfer it all at once. Yeah, it could be fractional interest over a period of time. And the ability of this fractional interest of current valuation theories allowed to take the discounts. So you could actually transfer your fractional interest at lower value. For example, if you're gonna transfer 10% of a, a $10 million company, your reportable value, it's not 1 million. Actually, it could be 700 because of the benefits of the, you know, taking the adjustments for lack of control and lack of marketability. So that is one thing that is very common. And I'm sure you all of you have heard about it when it comes to estate and gift planning. So I just nugget. want to make sure I mentioned that. It's a good nugget. Um, thank you. Um, Carolyn, there's a, obviously a whole whole world there to explore, but I love the fact that you're able to break it down into the three major valuation techniques and then add the comment about the importance of discounts. Um, with that, I'm just going to go to each of the panelists um, to have you guys just say, which valuation method did you rely on um, for your business succession plan? And I'm going to start with John, since I uh, forgot you in the last question. So John, which valuation method did you use for WCHI? We, um, we used a little bit of two, uh, but mostly it was multiples to, to, to kind of get the number on the piece of paper that they slide across the table. Um, and then, uh, but it turned out to be an asset purchase. And so the difference between the book value of all the assets they bought and the price we needed to get to to execute the sale was uh, was all goodwill on their part. So that that's the capital gains part. Um, and then in order to stretch the um, the the purchase price, um, which of course we wanted to do, and uh, is we uh, negotiated an earnout phase, which um, allowed us to say our company is worth this much and they said well if you think it's worth that much prove it so they uh they said you know they set a purchase price at here at close and then since i was planning to work you know four to five to six years later anyway they said if in year one you perform like you did um and uh then then we will pay you some more of that thing so a little bit more over time in order to stretch the, uh, the, the complete sales price. So. Awesome. Sounds like a textbook case here. Um, all right. Uh, Keith would love to hear your most recent experience, which valuation method was used. Well, they, they've all been all mine, just to be clear, C corp B2B and uh, uh, small to medium sized business that I've been involved with. And so with that preface, it's all been a multiplier of EBITDA. And um, the, the one thing I will say, when you are a CE in all this, I agree with just about everything Carolyn said, but I'll tell you the difference between asset sale and stock sale on a C in these situations, it's about half or double the money, whichever way you look at it, huh. because of the tax consequences that are involved. And so you, you definitely, as you said, talk to your banker, talk to your accountant, because you really need to understand that up front because the big number you see at first could be the same, 
the number in your pocket at the end could be radically different. Excellent point. Yep, clearly illustrated. And Leandra, I imagine for the ESOP, and we already heard the example of a restaurant, was it, uh, do you recall the valuation methods being done off gross revenue? Yeah, well, as an ESOP, we are required to appraise the company annually because we are paying benefits out annually. Um, so we use a um, third-party appraiser. They have a lot of experience with ESOPs and they use multiple approaches and kind of test them against each other. Um, we do rely heavily on like the income approach as well as the market approach as Car Carolyn um, indicated. Um, and yeah, I, it's been interesting. I, I, when I was brought into leadership, I didn't know that appraisals were on my horizon. Um, and it's an area where I have to wrap my brain around, you know, every once a year. And then I just kind of put it out to make room for other things. Um, it's not my, it's not my area of expertise. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, totally relatable. Uh, Fremont Bank also has an ESOP, which uh, is valued annually. So um, those of us who are the Fremont bankers are aware of that annual process as well. Awesome. Thanks. Well, uh, we've got about 11 minutes to go. And so what we're going to do is we've got one more. This is the rapid, rapid fire go around the room. All four panelists um, get to answer. Uh, it's either which questions do you wish you asked earlier in your process or like what was missed or um, what do you wish you did differently? Sort of. So what questions should, would, do you wish you asked or what do you wish you did differently um, in the whole process of the planning and, and transition? All right, we'll go with Leandra first, then John, then Keith, and Carolyn, you can bring us home with uh, whatever parting words you'd like. I think for us, the, the planning and execution around the plan was pretty tight. Um, what I think I didn't anticipate, and I don't want to speak for the owners, but um, I didn't anticipate how long and how much work it would take to educate employees and get them to understand the value of the benefit as well as the responsibility. Um, so that, that has been my experience and it's ongoing. Yeah, um, as new employees come in. Um, okay. Excellent point, thank you. Uh, John. Um, one of the things I wish we did earlier, um, this in our particular process, um, I wasn't sure that I was prepared to sell and I did not want to, uh, just in case the price came in too low, uh, and I didn't want to scare the employees. So we, I kept it extremely confidential. So Carolyn's advice to get your books in order. Um, so I wish I would have known all the things they would have needed. So that way I could have integrated that into the normal course of business. So when a potential buyer needed information, um, I would have had it at the ready, uh, but I didn't even want to go to the, to our controller and, and have them create documents. He had been through a previous acquisition, so he probably would have recognized what was going on. So, but other than that, very pleased with the uh, with the buyers and the opportunities we presented to our to our team. So it's good. Great, uh, Keith. Uh, I, I'll echo what John said. I'll I'll say this. Um, in all the experience I've had, I'll tell you, and the companies I've, I've looked at and other things, uh, almost everyone has their revenue go down during a process. Why? Because it's the hardest thing to do in your career. I will tell you, I've started a half a dozen companies. And again, I've already told you some of this. And the second hardest thing in my entire career is selling and going through this. So get your business in order is like the number one thing. I'll tell you in deals, always get a letter of intent up first. Always make sure it's a stock sale. Always try and make sure your revenue's got some growth. And then the other key thing is to worry about the reps and warranties, what the legal guy will tell you. And those are the four checklists. And if you can get that at the value you want, you're growing and your business is in good shape, hallelujah, go for it. Wow, that, that was a, uh, a lesson there, four, four points. I'm still writing them down. 
thank you. And, and Carolyn, uh, you know, you're the subject matter expert, for, but on this note, uh, your, your sign off words for what people yeah. should I would say always run the numbers first. Yeah, it helps in the negotiation. Like his, like his say, you know, for a C corporation, it could be a big difference. Yeah. And run your numbers and, and the purchase plans. Do you need to stay on the business for how long? Are there any contingent payments afterwards, you know, based on what? Yeah, all of this will help you make the decision whether you want to sell or, you know, what the price to, you know, to set for the sales price. Excellent, excellent summary. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, that was the bulk. And I feel like we just started like 10 minutes ago, but that was like about 50, 45 minutes. So what we're going to do next is, are we doing uh, giveaways, Michelle, or are we going to the Q&A? We're going into the Q&A. Awesome. All right. Um, what, what questions do we have for the panelists? All right, so we did have a couple of attendees send my questions to the chat box. So first question that we have is, how do you go about an ESOP? Are there companies that specialize in this type of transaction? Um, I'll take that. Leandra, yeah. Yeah, um, great question. There are, yes, there are several companies that special, specialize in ESOPs. There are several, um, a lot of them do broader financial work um, and some of them really focus solely on ESOPs. Um, there are third-party administrators. I would suggest that if you are thinking about setting up an ESOP, those are one of the first people that you talk to. I would not advise administering your own ESOP in terms of like making sure that the plan is written according to DOL and IRS guidelines as well as facilitating it. Um, you can do a lot of it in terms of like employee communications, but, and you could even write the checks if you want to, but it's I, that backup and knowing that your plan is being um, executed appropriately, I think is important. Um, and um, talking to some ESOP attorneys as well is um, valuable in getting some questions answered. I think that answers the question. All right. Great. Thank you, Leandra. Um, second question that we have that's been asked a few times. What were the four points again by Keith? <laughs> the last four points? Okay. So uh, as I said, the first thing you want is a letter of intent to buy the business at a valuation again that you need. So LOI is the very first thing. Second thing you want to do is make sure your revenue is not going to go down. You're on a slight uptrend on what you're doing. Third and uh, third thing really is uh, you want, again, if it's a C corp, it really, in my eyes, needs to be a stock sale. So that's important in any kind of a, arrangement. And the fourth one is, which you'll learn from bankers and legal and all that, is the only other thing that can bite you and they can withhold a bunch of money is reps and warranties. The rest of the stuff is important, but it's a small fish compared to the, those. Wow, thank you. Uh, Michelle. Yes, so another question we have here is, how did the Zachary founders get rewarded for their work? Did employees purchase shares? Do Zach and Barb still own shares and enjoy annuities? Great question. Um, the, they were reward, they essentially the company used profits to buy shares from them for the employee owners. There were no out of pocket costs to us. Um, and the last question is, um, no, they do not own any more shares. Some owners or founders will retain part of the shares and either be absent or um, present operators. Um, and Barbara and Zach decided that they really wanted to pass the torch fully our way and enjoy their retirement, which they are doing now. They're our number one fans is what they say. <laughs> well done. Awesome. We do actually have a few questions that were previously submitted um, prior to this event. So we'll... Um, 
try to answer them now. Um, so one of them is, who should benefit from my wealth my business has created? So who should benefit from the wealth the business has created? Correct. Ooh, who wants to take that one? John, I, I mean, I would just say, I think, oops. I think my bankers. <laughs> no, <laughs> bankers don't profit. But like, you know, I think the question is getting at, is it you personally as the main owner? Is it uh, your children? Is it um, how, I guess this question is kind of a little, little hard to deal with, but it's like, who are the parties? I think it's about identifying the parties that want to benefit or that you want to benefit from the transaction, right? Um, it, it could be, I could also see it. It could be that you want to leave a legacy on it. What do you want that to be? Uh, but not, not sure. Yeah. And I that, agree. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Alexis. I agree with what um, Keith just said in that for our founders, Barbara and Zach, their goals were to leave a legacy and also reward their um, long-term employees. Um, so those were their goals. So I don't think that there's any right answer. I think it's all about what the owner wants to achieve in their exit strategy, which is highly individualized and personal. Um, excellent way to interpret the question and, and to respond uh, to the benefit of all. And, and on the note of if, if what the desire is to leave a legacy or, uh, or there's a further wealth planning element, uh, that's where you might want a trust advisor or trust advisory services, which little plug for Fremont Bank, um, our financial, uh, our wealth management group has both financial advisors and trust advisors to help with this exact type of question and planning. Yeah, I also want to add just, you know, uh, planning ahead of time, give yourself, a, you know, ahead of time, allow yourself enough time to plan all this. It could either benefit your children, your successors, or your employees. The last person you want to benefit is IRS. So make sure you have your tax planning done, estate planning done. <laughs> Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, with that, it's uh, six o'clock and let's go to the prizes. Uh, we are just a few minutes um, behind. So prize number one, you guys, uh, you may, may or may not know, uh, but we are big into golf. So we have our first prize is golf balls in a golf tees gift basket. You get one dozen Titleist Pro V1s, which are very good golf balls, and a pack of Fremont Bank golf tees. All right, with that, Michelle, who is our lucky winner of our first prize? So lucky winner, prize number one is going to Pete Santu. Woo, He's, it's his lucky week. All right. Good Pete. day. Thank you. Great, thank you. Congratulations. All right. We'll have someone run those over tomorrow. Um, Prize number two, we have an outdoor adventure basket, which includes a Fremont Bank cooler backpack, which is pretty cool, and a picnic towel. Michelle, who is the lucky winner of our adventure gift basket? So lucky winner number two is going to Suzanne Swenson. Suzanne Swenson, you are the lucky winner of the outdoor adventure basket. All right. Congratulations. All right, finally, uh, in addition to golf, we really like wine. So we have a wine basket, which includes two reds and two whites. I'm betting they're from one of our clients. Is it indeed McGrail Vineyards? Yes. Awesome. And who is our lucky winner of the wine gift basket? So lucky winner number three, final winner is going to Jean Bjork. Yeah, awesome. I'm sure she'll enjoy that. All right, winners, you will receive an email from our events team um, after the event and we will connect you with your prize. All right, with that, it is 6.02 and this is what I'd like to offer up. Um, one, uh, a thank you to each of our panelists, our events team, our marketing team, and each of you uh, participants in, who said, I want information. Um, love that we as a community bank can offer you this type of content, it's 
pretty efficient and effective. It's online, but maybe it's even better than in person because we get in, we get out. You spend your cocktail hour with us. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm willing to, and I bet the panelists are willing to, stay online for some Q&A and a little debrief afterwards. So feel free to leave at this point if you'd like um, or stay on and uh, we'll just engage in an open Q&A for, for a little while. With that, everyone, um, thank you again for your time and attention. We appreciate you as clients and spread the good word. You have um, some previously submitted questions um, that we can go ahead and try to answer as well. Um, one, of, one of them is, what if someone wants to acquire my business? If it's an outsider or a franchiser, and how do I know that I am in a place to pull together what is needed to review? Ooh. Kind of lengthy one there. Yeah, I could answer that one because usually when we start a valuation process, you know, we ask for three to five years of financial records. And then the second step is to clean up and adjust the value. If you have assets that's too old, you know, we will adjust to the uh, current market value up for those assets. And this, the third step is just to normalize the income, as we mentioned earlier. Mm. So that is very typical requirement when someone even a buyer, you know, if they hire someone to value your business, that's what they will be looking for. Three to five years. If you have reviewed financial statement, that's perfect. If not, tax returns. We assume they're pretty reliable since they're reported to the government. And so you will want to have those ready. Good question. Um, I have one, and Michelle, this might be on your list too, but what is does anyone have experience designing, implementing, and communicating the plan to their family? Because family gets sticky. Um, anyone have to work through a, a communication plan? Not me, but I did have witnessed some very quite uncomfortable moments when, you know, when the negotiation or communicating or people get notified, daddy's going to give such and such. And especially when you, it's in the setting, you have one child working for the business and the other three, they don't. As a parent, how do you divide that? Right. right. So I think that's a tough, tough situation to help them communicate. And it was. Um, so as I said, so I have two older brothers they are actually plumbers, so they're customers. So it, that was an interesting dynamic to work through. Um, but uh, eventually, um, my parents, <laughs> they had the job of communicating to my brothers. And they said, hey, um, we didn't know what we were going to do until John joined the business. We hadn't had a succession plan. So, um, so obviously, and part of what we had done initially back in the early 90s was they were gifting shares to, um, to myself. Um, and then once I was married, they were gifting shares at the, at the legal limit at the time. And that's when we figured out we were growing the business faster than they could gift it. So that's when at some point we, um, and like I said before, and then we started borrowing money from Fremont Bank to have a line of credit. Um, that's when we, we executed uh, the purchase. There were there was interesting times there, but uh, we did work through it, and it, everybody's everybody's happy now. Every, it, it all worked out, and we're all good. Yeah, fascinating. Well, this has just been um, a fantastic sixty-eight minutes of my life. Um, it is so gratifying to have each of you be part of this and share your experience and your wisdom um, with you know, a broader group that we've brought together. Um, it, I think Michelle had said on Monday that we would like to, with your permission, allow um, if people reach out to us to, you know, we'll screen their inquiries, but then to pass on their questions to you. Um, you know, you never know what's gonna come of it. I know, Carolyn, you're in a, a little bit different position as one of the service you know, professionals and providers, um, but each of you may be, you know, tapped for some, some question. Keith, you know, you have such a 
a length, lengthy experience on so many different fronts. I really do appreciate how um, you were able to lay out the four points at the end. Um, each of you just, there was a ton of information that, and notes that we took down. I, I'm thinking Rolando is, is taking notes as well. So we Fremont bankers can sort of um, summarize and share internally um, with our business partners a little bit about what we learned. Um, Definitely, Alexis. We got a lot. Awesome. Um, with great, that, great content. Thank you. Um, sort of last call. I know there's a couple people hanging on. Any last questions um, or comments? Tarek, Don, or anyone else? Oh, we got a hand clap. Thank you, Charlotte Smith. Appreciate it. Um, all right. Cool. I, I imagine we're going to be re recognizing our panelists with some sort of gift. So um, that goes without saying. So we'll surprise you. But um, thanks again. You know, I really appreciate you taking you know the time to plan this as well as the time tonight. Um, you guys are valued partners for us. So thank you very much.